Can you all hear me? Who wants to be in a small group? Huh? You see, it's smarter to travel in groups. Nick, if you can just turn me down just a tad. Awesome. I'm still trying to recover from praise and worship. Um, Nick, I think turn that other one off. That one, yeah. A little bit more, a little bit more volume. Can you hear me? I'm coming, I'm getting there. Okay, there we go. So, sorry, I'm still trying to recover from this morning's worship. It's good to be in the presence of God. Amen. So, small groups, we're starting our small groups again this week. Yes, I always got to check this, make sure I'm in line. There's so many groups we're on, and Telegram groups, and and I get shouted at if I don't keep on tab with all the groups, but I've literally got, I think, about 30 groups or so. So, um, it's on. We've got small groups and fellowship this Thursday. So please join us. It's a great time where we can fellowship together, great messages. We're busy with the teaching, Pastor John's. Thank you, Rose. You could have left. Okay. <laughs> so, we're starting a new series. Okay, so for those of you who are wondering, we're starting a new series. So, come. Come expectant, amen. Who, who this morning came expectant to church? Did you all come expectant? You did. Awesome. Awesome. So the title of my message this morning is True Worshippers. And from Jabu's message to Lindy's message to Tithes and Offerings, there's been a common thread and it's touching on worship. So as you can see, and as you probably well noticed, that for the last... I would say a month or two, we're leaning in praise and worship more towards the worshipping. Have you noticed? Have you noticed? So we are positioning our hearts now to become more aware of the importance and of worshipping. Because I believe that is what God desires from us and I believe that is where God meets us, is in worship. Amen. So this morning we're going to look at that and the question I want to ask each and every one of you is are you a true worshipper? Are you a true worshipper? And while you're thinking about that, I want you just to close your eyes and we're just going to open in prayer and we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal new things afresh to us this morning. Father God, Holy Spirit, I need you this morning. I need you to minister through me for without you I couldn't even attempt to try and do this on my own. I'm a million, million, million needs, Father. And I ask that you this morning meet each and every one of our needs, Lord Father. I ask that you touch us in a new, fresh way. That you reveal new things to us this morning. I ask this morning that you crack open those hearts, Lord. And you soften those hearts this morning for your message, Lord. And for your heart that we can become aware of your desires, Lord. I pray that this be done now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. So, for the last <clears throat> few weeks, months, we've been preaching on a theme of about relationships. I know Pastor Charmaine even touched on it last week where she mentioned about going back to your first love. And for a long time, my God's been speaking to us about that. Going back to our first love. Going back to the relationship that He desires from us. If you think about it, in the time of Adam and Eve, they communed with God. They walked with God in the garden. So they were in fellowship with Him. But then when sin entered, there was that separation. All along did God try to reunite us and reinstall that fellowship and that relationship back together with Him. And it took us a very long time. And I still believe that God's still working on our hearts. For us to be in the position, and to remember family, it's a vertical position, not a horizontal position. A horizontal position is where we get confused, where we start to think about the works and the ministry aspect. But it's a vertical relationship, it's a vertical aspect. Where God wants us to be in relationship with Him. He desires that from us. So much so that He sent His Son to die on the cross, that we can be reunited with Him. And be in perfect fellowship with him. If that doesn't touch your heart and pull on your heartstrings, I don't know what more Christ needs to do in order for you to have that revelation. 
I also, I can't even remember, I think it was a few months back, I ministered on, and one of my, my um, verses that I used, I spoke about the, the ten virgins. And I spoke about the five and the f- uh, wise and the five foolish. Sorry, I'm still trying to recover. <laughs> oh, gee whiskers. Wow. We spoke about the five wise and the five foolish. And we could see that Jesus was referring to two different types of people. And I asked you that question is, which type do you find yourself in? Where do you find yourself? And I think a lot of us became aware of the fact that we're possibly leading towards the foolish virgin. Because we think we are wise and we think we are ready and we think we are full. But I think he's revealed to us that we are far from full. So he desires from us to be continually filling our lamps. How do we fill our lamps? One of the ways is through worship. When we step into his presence, when we step into his presence in worship and we continue to move in the presence of the Lord, he fills our lamps. That is how our lamps get filled. It's through worship. But it's a heart posture. It's a heart posture where you've got to posture your heart. You know, you come before the Lord. I've prayed to God many a times where I say, Lord, give me new desires. Give me a new heart, Lord. A heart for you, Father. A heart to realize and have the revelation of your love. Every single day. Because habits can creep in. Things can start to come and form in our lives. They can take us away from that. And no sooner than later do we realize that we are actually walking like the foolish virgins. Do you know that Jesus said they are foolish? That if you are not filling your lamps, you are classified to be foolish. That was a warning. He's saying, be like the wise. Fill your lamps. Because when I come, and I'm coming, it might be too late. And then you're going to be running around searching and looking for oil. And I'm sorry, it's going to be too late. He's looking for a perfect bride. A perfect bride that is ready. Because he's coming. Amen. Oh, he's coming. I can't wait. James 4 verse 8. The first scripture for the day. 4 verse 8. It says, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Draw near to Him. How do we draw near to Him? In worship, correct. We step into His presence. It's when we step into His presence of worship, when we come into His presence, that the Word of God says that He will draw near to us. If He's feeling distance, if He's feeling like He's far away, He's waiting for you to step into His presence. To step into the presence of the Lord. The longer we worship God, and I've experienced this, when you start to worship God, you become so accustomed and aware of the time, don't you? I've got five minutes, I've got ten minutes. We set a boundary for God. But as we start to step into His presence, and we dig deeper, and we go further and more, His presence starts to become more tangible, doesn't it? Because that's what He desires for. He desires that from us. John 4 verse 23. John 4 23, I'm reading on the New King James Version. It says, this is Jesus. Jesus said, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You know, when Jesus was asked, what is show us the Father? He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So He was telling everybody, those are the desires. If you look at me, what I say to you, that is the desires of the Father. It says that the Father is seeking those to worship Him. He longs for you to step into worship with Him. But we always put a time on it. We're always so rushed, aren't we? The bottom line of what Jesus is telling us here is that God is searching for those who will worship Him in spirit. 
Now, spirit is that it must originate from the heart. It's a position from the heart. It's a sincere motive towards God. But it's triggered from the Holy Spirit within. Understand something that we've been given the Holy Spirit right. Correct? The Holy Spirit's desire is for us to be in relationship and fellowship with God. Correct? So it's the Holy Spirit inside of us that is leading us to that fellowship and to that worship. How awesome is that? So if we're just in tune with the Holy Spirit, He will lead us into fellowship and into worship. That's what Jesus was saying, is that God is Spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now what is truth? Truth is the revelation of the Scripture through the Word. That when we read the Word of God, as we're reading the Word of God, we become it becomes revelation and He reveals Himself to us through the Word. That is what Jesus was saying in spirit, position of the heart, and in truth, through revelation in the Word. Isn't the Scriptures just beautiful? Now one of the seven major feasts held every year in Israel is one of them is known as the Feast of the Tabernacle. This feast, or this feast, sorry, generally occurred during autumn after the time of harvesting. So after they would harvest all their crops, all their the plantations and everything that they had reaped throughout the time, they have reaped everything, they harvested the time. It was a great time where they could get together and they could celebrate the harvest. They could be, um, it could be festivity, good festivity. Can you imagine them all gathering together and reaping the harvest? A lot of festivity. A lot of joy rejoicing going on. Jesus, we pick up in um, John 7 verse 37. Jesus appeared to them at this Feast of Tabernacles on the last day. And he was crying out to them. Jesus was crying out in John 7 verse 37. He cried out saying, if anybody thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Oh, how we long, don't we? Oh, how we thirst. Jesus is saying, if you thirst, come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. We can understand living in the city that water is life, is it not? We cannot be without water. So Jesus is saying, I am the life. I am the way. Come to me and drink. Step into my presence. Drink from me. Literally drink from me. Be in the word. Be in prayer. Be in my presence. Continually. The water, he says, is available for those who thirst. For those who are hungry for more of God. And the question you should be asking is, am I hungry for more of God? Be real with yourself. Am I comfortable where I am? Or am I hungry for more? Do I thirst for more of Him? Hebrews 11 verse 6. Hebrews 11 6 of the New King James says, He who comes to God must believe that He is. And, he that, and that He is a reward of those who diligently seek Him. How do we receive salvation? Through revelation. Correct. It's by faith. We believe who He says He is. And it's revealed by faith. I don't think any of us were there. Correct? Nobody. Go. So it's by revelation that has been revealed to us who He was. So we believe who He is. And it says that He is a rewarder of those who diligently Seek Him. So when you step into His presence diligently, you go looking for Him, you go searching for Him, you go searching for that God encounter, the Word of God says that He is a rewarder. He will meet you in that place. You see, family, our goal here is to desire and to create a desire in our heart to want to spend more time with Him, to have a deeper, have a closer, a more meaningful relationship. We're all working on that, correct? We're all building on that. It's a desire in our heart. And like I said, I pray daily, Lord, give me that desire. 
I don't want to get to a place where I'm just comfortable. Give me our desire. Everything stems and originates from a relationship. When we concentrate and build on the relationship, everything will then accumulate or stimulate from that and originate from it. But it starts off with the relationship with Jesus. If we're not prepared to build on the relationship and desire a relationship with Him, we cannot expect everything He has to offer. We cannot go cherry picking, in other words. Oh, I want that. Oh, Lord, I need that. Relationship. That's what He wants from us. Searching Him. Now, I'm going to speak about a, a story in the Bible, which I think we all know well. When Isaac was an old man and he was almost totally blind, he called for his son Esau. Now, Esau was his older son. And told him that it was time to receive the older son's birthright blessing. Remember when Rebecca gave birth, there were two sons, correct? Twins, Esau and Jacob. So Esau was the firstborn. The word of God says he was red and hairy. <laughs> I had a chuckle, I said, he was red and hairy? Can you imagine? Okay, but he was red and hairy. Then what happened was Isaac, Isaac knowing Isaac, sorry. Jeez, I'm really, wow, Lord, I need your help, man. I promise you. Um, Isaac knew that it was on his, best, on his deathbed. He knew that it was on his last. So he called his oldest son, Esau, to him and said to him, I'm going to be praying, praying, oh, wait, sorry, sorry, people, just ignore me. I'm going to be praying the blessing and the promise of the blessing onto you because it was due to the first one, correct? And what he asked him to do is he asked him then to go out and to go hunt for venison and to make a stew, a pot, because that was his favorite. And once he went and brought the stew in, he would then, after eating of that stew, he would then pray the blessing over Esau. That's what he said. So, of course, Esau went off to go perform that. And we know from an earlier scripture, if you read earlier, Esau after coming back from being in the field, was parched and he was hungry. And Jacob, his younger brother, was preparing what they call pottage, which is like a cabbage stew. He was preparing it, and when Esau came in and he smelt that aroma and being hungry, he said, please just give me a plate of that stew. I'm parched, I'm hungry. To which Jacob then said to him, that if, you, if I give this to you, I want to sell me your birthright. And what was interesting to see there, how easy it was for Esau to hand over his birthright. It says there in scripture that he said, but it was, it's not much meaning for me. You can have it anyway. That's how easy he handed it over to his brother. He didn't see any value in his birthright. And that was a revelation to me because I thought, you know what, we are born again. We've stepped into the family. We've received salvation. Do we value our birthright? Or are we like Esau, just prepared to hand it out and sell it? <laughs> so Jacob desired the birthright of his brother, and which was sold to him for plate of pottage, which was stew. Now Rebecca, Isaac's wife, overheard the conversation. And it says there in scripture that Jacob was Isaac, I was Rebecca's favorite son. She overheard the conversation and she called Jacob to her room and she said to him, listen, I want to ask you, what you need to do is you go out into the field to get a goat, to kill that goat, bring the meat, I will then prepare the stew like Isaac likes, I'll prepare it in a way that he likes. Then you take the skin of the goat you take that skin and you put it around your neck and you put it around your hands and you go into your father's room and your father will think that you are Esau. Now Isaac, Isaac, when he walked into the room, smelt Jacob's clothing and it smelt like Esau. And he touched his hands and it touched his neck and he was hairy. So he thought that it was his older son Esau. And then after eating, he went and 
spoke the blessing over him. And I'm going to read the blessing to you now. It's not on the overhead. But you'll find that blessing in Genesis 27, verse 28. Chapter 27, verse 28 says, Therefore God give you of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone that curses you, and blessed be he that blesses you. That was the blessing that was prayed over by Isaac, over Jacob. Now when Esau came back, the word of God says that Isaac was no, uh, Jacob was no sooner gone, where Esau stepped into the room with the prepared meal that he's bringing his father, like his father required. And obviously after realizing what had happened, his father said, but I've really play, prayed the birthright blessing over to your brother. So it says there that Esau was so enraged and so angry that he then vowed to go out and kill his brother. Isaac then had to flee for his life. He fled to a distant country called Haran where he stayed with his uncle Laban. Now we know from a previous teaching where uncle Laban kept, kept Jacob there for 20 years. And what's interesting to know is he kept him there for 20 years and remember when every time he wanted to leave, he couldn't. And when he asked for the daughter of Uncle Laban, he was deceived. Remember the story? And what's interesting to realize that in that whole scripture is he was deceived by Uncle Laban because he deceived his dad, thinking that he was Esau. So he was reaping the harvest that he had sown. Yeah. Yo, that's a big revelation. Be mindful of what you sow. 20 years he was deceived. 20 years he had to endure. 20 years he stayed with Uncle Laban, but he prospered. Why did he prosper? Because of the blessing that was prayed over him by his father. Then after 20 years, God told Isaac to leave Haran and to come back to the land that he has given his grandfather, Abraham. Remember God said to Abraham, your descendants shall be many, they shall be blessed. So God had then commanded him to go back to the land that was given to him. And on his way back, he then came to hear about that his brother Esau, remember, the one who wanted to kill him, vowed to kill him was on his way to him. Now, I don't know about you, but I can imagine, I don't think that was a reunion party that I think Jacob was looking forward towards. So we can understand that he realized what was taking place and he realized what had happened. But because God had commanded him and told him, I need you to go back, he was obedient to go back to where he needed to be. Genesis 32 verse 17, we'll pick it up there and I want to read this to you and I want you to have a look at this. Genesis chapter 32, and I'm going to be reading from verse 17. And he commanded the first one, saying, now this is Jacob commanding his servants. Remember, Jacob was blessed. God had prospered him. He had servants. He had wives. He had camels. He had everything. So it says here that he commanded the first one, the first servant, saying, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, saying, to whom do you belong? And to where are you going? Those or whose are those in front of you? Then you shall say, they are your servant, Jacob's. You see what he did there? They are your servant, Jacob's. It is a present to my Lord, Esau. So he was commanding his servants to say that, preparing the way, that by the time he come there, there would hopefully be a better welcoming. So he commanded the second and the third and all who followed the drove, saying, In this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. And also say, Behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with presence that goes before me. And afterward I will see his face. Perhaps then he will accept me. So the present went on before him, but he himself lodged that night in the camp. Okay, so he had come up with this plan send these servants ahead with gifts in different droves that they could give to Esau to hopefully soften his heart for it says for your servant 
my Lord, Jacob is coming. Then we get to verse 22. And this is the one I want you to see. Verse 22 out of chapter 32. 22. It talks about wrestling with God. And he arose, who is he? Jacob arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the fort of Jabbok. He took them and sent them over the brook and sent over what he had. So we can see from that scripture that he was a blessed man, correct? He was a prosperous man. So he sent everything over. And it says there that he, Jacob, was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Verse 25. Now when he saw what he, that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day break. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I will not let you go until you bless me. I will step into your presence, Lord. I will step into your time of worship, Lord. And I'm not going to stop and I'm not going to let go until you bless me. I'm going to step into your presence, Father. And when I feel your presence, I'm going to continue to hold on. Because that's what I desire. And I'm not letting you go. I'm going to hold on until you bless me. Are you getting this? Does it excite you? It should excite you. Because God is saying to all of us this morning that we need to hold on. We need to step into his presence and we need to hold on. It says that Jacob wrestled with him. He didn't want to let him go. And Jesus, who it was, said to him, let me go because the sun is coming up. And he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. <laughs> to which then Jesus said, to the man, what is your name? I think we all know that he knew what his name was, but he wanted to hear what he said. To which Jacob said, my name is Jacob. And then Jesus said that your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and you have prevailed. Now, according to the Nelson Study Bible, the name Israel can also mean prince with God. We know the story where Abraham's name was changed to Abraham because he had to speak it. God had a plan. Remember when Rebecca birthed birth two kids, the two children were going to be two nations. God had a plan that there had to be a perfect lineage for Christ to come down. But he wasn't going to be known, and they weren't going to be known as the children of Jacob, no. They were going to be known as the children of Israel. So he had to change his name. Then Jacob asked him, saying, tell me your name. Who are you? I want to know. I pray, what is your name? And that's when he said, he said, what is it that you ask about my name? And he, which was Christ, blessed him, Jacob, there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Now Jacob wanted God's blessing in his life, just like he persuaded for his brother to sell him his birthright blessing. God want, Jacob wanted God's blessing. That's why he wrestled with him. That's why he held on to him. And I think God's speaking to all of us this morning saying, how hungry are you? Are you prepared to hold on? Are you prepared to wrestle? Or do you get tired after a few minutes in my presence? See, the blessing Jacob received prospered him greatly. And after 20 years of working with Uncle Laban, Jacob became exceptionally, the word of God says, wealthy. Exceptionally wealthy. But even though Jacob experienced great wealth and blessing, there was much missing in his personal development with God. And God required that in order for Jacob to bear the responsibility of cultivating a nation that would allow God to bring His Word, the Word, through the salvation message of Jesus Christ. He had to change his heart. He had to change the way he saw himself. 
And we can understand that God, think about this, God had planned this from the time that sin had entered the world of Adam and Eve. God had planned that he was going to send Jesus Christ, perfect man, to walk on this earth. He had to come from a perfect lineage. God had planned it all from the beginning. That he had put this in motion. But he knew that he had to change his name. Because they were going to be known as the children of Israel, not the children of Jacob. The only way that Jacob could be brought to a place of transformation was through the God encounter that he experienced. It was the only way. When you come into the presence of God, when you get a touch from, the, from God, you will not be the same. You will not be the same. You see, Jacob reached a point where he said that, you know what, not my will be done, but let your will be done. Not with my desires, Lord, not with my wants, but your desires for my life. That's what I want. He had a change. Complete heart change. You see, family, when God touches you, you will not be the same. When Jesus touched Jacob on the hip, caused the hip socket to go out of place because his flesh had to change. His flesh had to change. When Jesus touches you, you will not be the same. This encounter that he experienced was through travailing and deep prayer. And the family, I'm going to tell you this morning, we can experience that through worship. Worship. Continue spending time in worship. Put on praise and worship and just worship the Lord. Come before him and just raise up your hands and just worship on him. And when he steps into your presence, we need to be like Jacob and we need to just hold on and not let go. And say, I'm not letting you go. I've seen you, I've touched you, I'm not letting you go. I've experienced you and I'm not letting you go. And when we read the story of the brothers, which was so great after this, that after this what took place, God was able to change Esau's heart towards his brother. And when they were reunited, there was so much joy and love and celebration of the anger and the fact that he wanted to kill him prior to that. God was able, but it came from a time in his presence. Amen? Let's all just bow our heads.
pustinju. But it comes by being diligent in the time of worship. Thank you, Lord, for these revelations. We thank you for the truth that you've spoken through your word. Let it penetrate our hearts, Lord. Let it crack open our hearts. Let us stand before you empty, Lord, that you can fill us with more of you. Stand before you hungry, hungry, thirsty. Just like Jesus said, for all those who are thirsty, come to me and drink. This morning he's calling each and every one of you, saying, come drink from me. Family, it's a possession of one's heart. It cannot be like the foolish virgins. Time is not on our side. We don't know the time that he's coming back. We don't know. All I know that it is soon. There's a great urgency in my spirit and I sense it now that God is speaking to us saying, prepare, prepare, prepare. Fill yourself with oil. Because the bridegroom is coming for his perfect bride. His bride that is ready and waiting. And he's going to take those that are ready. And the ones that are going to be left behind are going to be running around, knocking on doors, looking for oil. But there won't be enough time. I urge you this morning. Let us be like the wise virgins. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in worship. Fill your oil. Fill your oil. Step into His presence. Let Him become more real to you than a person that we read in a story. Let Him become so real to you that as you read the scripture, He becomes so real to you. Anybody that needs prayer, I'm up in the front, so please feel free to.